of joy and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is specifically the Gospel lesson, but the other readings as well, and you've heard them read. Uh, you have the Gospel lesson printed in your bulletins. Martin Luther once said, <clears throat> If you preach the Gospel in all aspects, with the exception of the issues which deal specifically with your time, you're not preaching the Gospel at all. Why not? Because you're not applying it to the important issues that we all face. And the challenge then I have in preaching is to declare to you the unchanging truth of God's Word and the Gospel of Jesus Christ in a culture that is always changing. And so, for instance, the Apostle Paul told us, do not be conformed to this age. So, you know, if you wonder about the tie, don't swim the way everybody else is swimming just because they're all swimming that way. That's my favorite ride. By the way, my favorite summer ride, the lazy river. Just keep drifting along the way everybody else is drifting. Don't be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, we need to be aware of our age and our culture, but not be conformed to it, not be shaped by it, but by our God. Easier said than done. In fact, when you start discussing Christ and culture in any way, it is really a bigger topic than we can deal with today or even in a four-week series. For instance, one of the most famous works on this is Niebuhr's book, Christ and Culture. Many other books have been written in response to that one. He basically laid out five different ways of relating to Christ and culture. And stay with me, I'm just laying the foundation for this series. He started out Christ against culture. And that's where Christians basically withdraw from society, kind of like the Amish groups that try to live separately from the world around them, neither influenced by nor influencing the culture. And then there's Christ of culture where Christians fully embrace culture and get immersed in it and eventually start, unfortunately, uh, letting, you know, interpreting the Bible according to the culture. This is where liberal Christian churches fit in, where anything goes, basically, and eventually they're no different from the world around them. Christ above culture is a little above that, um, but still engaging culture, still very friendly to it. I would say this is kind of like, if you remember Robert Schuller in the Crystal Cathedral, um, trying to weave uh, philosophy to the Bible, power of positive thinking, and so on, but unfortunately sometimes being willing to redefine what the Bible actually says. Um, Christ and culture in paradox. I would kind of fit more in the middle. Uh, this model views Christians as citizens of two kingdoms, the kingdom of the left and the kingdom of the right. We exist in both of those kingdoms. And I'll talk more about that in the church and state message in a couple of weeks. Basically, this model sees Christians as citizens of society, living and working among Christians and non-Christians, but at the same time, living as a citizen of Christ's kingdom. In that sense, we're to influence our culture naturally as we live out our Christian faith and vocations. This would be a historic Lutheran understanding. Niebuhr's fifth understanding of Christ and culture, really a more extreme position, Christ transforming culture. This is where Christians would take over the culture and write all the laws. And really, the Christian right has sort of tried to do that over the last number of years. If you take this to the extreme, you might equate it with the true desire of Islam, wherever it's a majority around the world, to be governed by Sharia law, church law. All right, that's, that's all the farther I'll go with that. I understand if that stuff is not in your wheelhouse, but these are big thoughts, and it pays to pay attention to big thinkers who have uh, wrote about these things. And I would challenge you not to let me be the one to do all that reading for you but to read and study God's Word and what others are saying about it and to be willing to have your thinking challenged so that it isn't just subconsciously being conformed to this world, but instead that all of your thinking will always be transformed by God's Word. So, for instance, there's a popular saying that Christians are to be in the world but not of the world. 
Anybody know where that verse is in the Bible? In the middle? Uh, <clears throat> that's kind of a whole other book that I'm in the middle of. A uh, 400-page uh, book called Center Church by uh, Timothy Keller. Outstanding. Tiny little print. Um, wow. Big stuff. No, it's not in the middle. Uh, anybody know where that verse is in the Bible? How many of you think that is a, a Bible verse? How many of you don't think it's a Bible verse? How many of you don't want to participate? <laughs> wow. It's actually not in the Bible. I know because I thought it was, and I, I tried to find it, and I couldn't find it. This is what I found, Christ's high priestly prayer to God the Father. He said this of his followers, I have given them your word, Father, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is that uh, is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So Christ does say that we are not of the world. But he also does not give us the luxury of just living in the world, but staying away from the people of the world. Instead, he has sent us into the world. In the same way, he told us that we are the salt of the earth, and we are the light of the world. And Paul tells us that we are children of God in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life to the world. So obviously God wants us to make a difference in our culture, and we have to figure out how best to do that in every age. Really, if you go back to those five uh, different models of how Christ influences, impacts culture, and how he wants us to bring Christ to the culture, I think all of those models have some merit and all of them have some drawbacks. But anyway, that gives us a starting point to get into this series on Christ and culture and to address this first big topic, terrorism in our times. First, I just want to say that Mr. Luke, I think, really nailed it this morning when it comes to all of the things in life that cause us terror. God is bigger than all of it. Whatever is going to happen, God can handle it. The Old Testament lesson is just a perfect example of God trying to explain that to his people. So take a look at that lesson again. I want to point something out to you. Look at these little phrases. What's that? What's that? What's that? Now, I've always said that when God repeats himself three times in the Bible, we really ought to pay attention. When God says something once in the Bible, we ought to pay attention. When he says something three times, we really, really, really should pay attention. And what's, what comes later? Do not fear. Why not? Because I will help you. And I will help you, and I myself will help you. I will help you, I will help you, I will help you. Do you think you should pay attention to that message? I think you should. Folks, worry is faith in reverse. No matter what is happening around us, we need to trust God and claim the fact that God is with us and God has promised to help us. That said, we get in now to the topic of terrorism. On Tuesday morning this week, 84-year-old father Jacques Hamel was celebrating Mass in his small church in France when two men armed with knives stormed in and slit his throat, killed him. ISIS has taken responsibility. It is a scene that has become all too familiar in our world today. In fact, I thought about listing the various terrorist attacks that have been committed recently by Islamic extremists. You need to understand that, well, let me just, let me just stop. 
I decided as I looked them up, there were way too many of them, and so I decided instead to let the screen roll through the last 179 terrorist attacks throughout the world that have all happened in just the last 30 days. Now, they're not all ISIS-related, but if we're going to be honest about terrorism in our times, we are going to have to deal with the fact that almost all of the terrorist attacks have been committed by Islamic extremists. We need to, it's important to remember that not all Muslims are terrorists, in fact, just a very small percentage. But the sad fact is that the vast majority of terrorists have been Muslims. Now, that is not a bigoted or racist statement. It is just a fact. And the question is then, how will we respond to that fact? Well, again, if you're going to deal with this honestly, then Christians and really every society and especially Western cultures should invest some time trying to understand the religion of Islam. Once again, that requires some effort on your part to do some reading. You cannot expect me to do all that reading for you. Today, I'll give you just a very brief outline. First of all, Islam is the Arabic form for the word submission. It does not mean peace. It means submission. It's a religion created from the teachings of Muhammad who lived around 600 A.D., 600 years after Christ. He correctly disagreed with the polytheism of his people. They were worshiping many gods, and they had many idols. And so he began to teach that God is one. People of Mecca, especially the sellers of idols, didn't like that. As you can imagine, it cut into their profits. And they gave him a hard time and basically kicked him out of the city. He moved to Medina, slowly gathered a large following, and started attacking the caravans of Mecca in retaliation stealing their goods, and finally he conquered that city and eventually all of Arabia. Many years after he died, his followers put together his sayings in a book they called the Quran, which is basically a series of commands and warnings. From these sayings, Muhammad's followers developed the five pillars of Islam that every Muslim must practice. I'll look at them very quickly. Uh, reciting daily, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Prayer at least five times a day facing Mecca. The giving of alms, but only to Muslim causes. Fasting uh, during the month of Ramadan. Uh, I've had Muslim friends uh, tell me that they really just flip the day on its head, so they sleep during the day because they only have to fast during the day and they work at night during that month, but... That's one of the five pillars. And then, uh, sorry, I'm behind one. There you go. And then uh, the Hajj, a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in their lifetime, where they kiss the Kaaba stone, a meteorite that uh, they claim was the rock that uh, uh, Jacob slept on. A lot more could be said about each of them, but the key thing is that Islam is a religion Totally of works. For them, God is aloof. He's powerful and he is unknowable. They have no concept then of forgiveness or grace. Everything must be earned. And no Muslim can ever be sure that they've done enough. However, some imams convince a small percentage of Muslims that if they die in jihad, a holy war against infidels, they will be guaranteed a place in paradise. And they use many of the surahs, the teachings in the Quran to justify this. For instance, this one. When the sacred months have passed, then kill the polytheists wherever you find them and capture them and besiege them and sit and wait for them at every place of ambush. And there are many similar examples. Indeed, the penalty for those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive upon earth uh, to cause corruption is none but that they be killed or crucified or that their hands and feet be cut off from opposite sides or that they be exiled from the land. These are the kinds of teachings that lead the terrorists to shout out, Allahu Akbar. God is greater. Not God is great, as you might have read in the uh, newspapers. But God is greater, and there is a world of difference in that for the devout Muslim. God is greater than your culture. 
God is greater than your country. Our God is greater than your God. To devout Muslims, God is not merciful. God is not forgiving. God is not loving. God is great. And all must submit to them if they don't choose to Him. If they don't choose to, they must be forced to submit. And there's a lot more, but that hopefully will begin to help you understand why a very small percentage of Muslims commit acts of terror. For us, it's just hard to believe that any religious person would kill innocent people on the street. After all, the people they are killing aren't soldiers. They're not hurting anyone, so what is the point? Well, first of all, don't, they don't think that any infidel, any unbeliever, is innocent. They group Westerners and Christians in with the worst parts of our culture. They see in our culture abortion, pornography, drunkenness, addictions, and so on. They see Western culture as a Christian culture. And so if Christians can't get rid of those evils in our culture, then we must support them. We are a corrupt culture and we need to be defeated. And the bombings and the beheadings and the terror is designed to bring us, all of us around the world, to submission to Allah. And in that sense, uh, yeah, I'm not going to get political until two weeks from now, church and state, but I would say, maybe I'll step away from the pulpit, I would say that George W. Bush, I believe, did a disservice to our country and to the world when he declared that Islam is a religion of peace. It is not and has never been a religion of peace. It really is a totally different worldview. It's a religion of submission, forced or voluntary. And any denying of that is not going to keep us safe and it is not going to help us reach out to a people who are trapped in a worldview that cannot bring them peace. This really is a war of worldviews. And Islam is a worldview that is totally foreign to someone who grows up in the land of the free where nobody tells us what to do. And so what do we do about it? Well, if you think about Christ and culture in terms of the kingdom of the left and the kingdom of the right, then our government, representing the kingdom of the left, has a responsibility to protect its citizens. And so they may well have to use force and even war to do that. But that response is incredibly complicated. And well-meaning Christians and citizens are going to differ when it comes to using force and war. We can probably all agree that whatever we've done in the last 30 years or so has not been effective. And I, for one, simply do not feel capable or equipped of saying what would be effective. Speaking of complicated, protecting our country also involves an energy strategy so that we as a country are not dependent on oil from countries that consider us to be their enemies. It may also involve helping war-torn countries develop infrastructure and jobs so that ISIS will have a tougher time recruiting, especially disillusioned and unemployed young people, to become terrorists. It should involve efforts to protect, especially Christians and Jews, from persecution in Muslim-controlled lands. But folks, after all of those efforts to protect ourselves from terror and terrorists, we who live as citizens of the kingdom of God have a higher calling than that. We've been sent by Jesus into the world to be salt and light, to shine like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life to everybody. And in order to do that, we need to recognize this is a war, but it is a war of worldviews. And it's going to take some study by all of us to equip ourselves to fight this war. It's going to take putting on the armor of God that we read about in the epistle lesson. But Christians, as citizens of God's kingdom, need to pay attention to the way in which God wants us to fight. So Paul says, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, folks, in order to demolish strongholds and arguments and worldviews, we are going to have to get off our Bibles and get into them, open them up, and start to fill ourselves with the knowledge of God. 
How can you fight this worldview of works righteousness if you don't know and can't tell people about a better way? And Jesus has shown us a better way. Remember last week I quoted the book of Romans about people who are filled with hate. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. It's so true of any terrorist, whether they're inspired by Islam or any other religion or ever, any other worldview, the way of peace they do not know, and so they've resorted to ways of violence. Folks, true peace can only be found in forgiveness. In the good news that your sins are forgiven and you are right with God. And that isn't about anything that you do, but what's been done for you. And only Jesus can offer the forgiveness of sins because only He has paid the price for all our sins. He did it by taking responsibility for them on the cross. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Jesus paid those wages for us and for every human being who ever lived or ever will live, including those twisted by hate. And he rose triumphant from the grave to guarantee his power over sin and death and the devil. Jesus is the way to true peace in your life and to the life of every human being. We have the answer, but do we have the courage to speak it and to live it? Not just to terrorists, not just to our Muslim neighbors and co-workers and friends, but to all of the people in our lives. Earlier this year, I talked to you about the radical nature of Christ's love and his willingness to forgive by showing you this picture from Michael Belk. It's almost too much, isn't it? To see this Jewish Jesus walking and talking with a Nazi soldier and carrying his pack and his gun. What could be more difficult than for a Jew to forgive a Nazi for the Holocaust? I don't know. What could be more difficult than for the Jewish Jesus to forgive the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims and the Buddhists and every person who ever lived for piling their sin onto his back? But that was the entire point of His coming. Our sins pushed the crown of thorns onto His head. Our sins drove the nails into His hands and feet. And as they were being driven in, He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In fact, what's more difficult? This picture or what Jesus actually says? You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, I love our church. I love the members of our church. It's wonderful to be part of this fellowship where we help bear each other's burdens and we take this journey of life together. That's kind of the easy part of what God has called us to do. But loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you that is a different ballgame, isn't it? Folks, again, we will talk about church and state in a couple of weeks, so I'll have to talk a little about politics and elections then, a little. Let me just say, folks, Donald Trump is not going to do that. Hillary Clinton is not going to do that. They're certainly not going to do it for each other as they campaign against each other in the next few months. You need to do that. Only you can be the people of the cross. People who have been forgiven, who know what forgiveness and peace is, and can offer it to those around you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, while you were being nailed to that cross, you prayed for your enemies and for us. Father, forgive them. You've told us to do the same, to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. Lord, that is not natural. It's supernatural. That means we'll need your help and your presence as we go from your house today. Lord, give us the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to live our lives without fear and terror 
and to completely change the way we feel about people who hurt us and hate us. Help us to love our enemies and to realize that it is Satan who is the real enemy and who has taken captive many to do his will, to steal and kill and destroy. But, O Lord, you have come that we might have life and have more of it. Help us to fully embrace that joy-filled life and freely extend it to all of the people in our lives. For your name's sake we pray it. Amen. Amen.